I've been actually listening to all the sessions since the time I came, and I've been trying to figure out what exactly I should talk about, because before I came in, I wasn't very clear on what should my topic be. So I sort of took brand conclave literally, and I thought we are going to talk about brands. You know, on a Friday afternoon, we'll talk about brands when our consumers probably don't talk about it at all. So that's how I have structured this. And I have obviously, coming from a consumer research background, uh, brought a lot of data with me because it's great to have conversations around different things. But finally, what leads to business outcome, what is proven to lead to business outcome is probably what we should all, as brand marketers, as uh, chief marketing officers, engage with. So I mean, I'm not going to introduce Kantar. Kantar is arguably world's largest consumer data and analytics company. And what I'm going to show you is based on hard evidence, hard evidence based on close to 2,000 brand tracks that we do globally, about 5 billion data points that we capture as a part of uh, what we do annually called Brand Z, which values the world's most valuable brands. And we celebrated 10th year in India last year. And we also capture huge amount of data uh, from our world panel, which looks at shoppers and what they buy on a regular basis. So there are a lot of data points that Kantar captures. And what I'm going to show you is based on that. So this is a very, it's a marketing truism, which is double jeopardy. Double jeopardy, basically, what does it mean? It just means that if you're a big brand, you will continue to grow. And why will you continue to grow? Because you are more available, you are more accessible, you are there on the shelf, and therefore the consumer will recall you more. And so it's, it sets in place a natural motion of growth, which is what big brands tend to benefit from, because they come to the mind more fluently and they are more physically available. But does that mean that small brands absolutely have no chance to break through? Obviously not. Many small brands, and we were discussing many D2C brands just uh, in the session before, have broken through. They have broken through the psychological construct of big brands tend to keep growing. And they have done that because the only way to grow is not just to be mentally and physically available. There are other ways to grow. And if I was to share with you what does all the data that we have, when we put it together and we looked at what drives brand growth, and there's so much of discussion here around performance marketing. I didn't hear the word brand building, by the way. I heard a lot of words, but, and a lot of words around performance marketing. We talk about search engine optimization. We talk about a lot of these things, but we, the fundamental, which is how do I build a great brand? So just to tell everybody in this room, Coca-Cola remains the most chosen brand globally for as many years as we can go back to. Yes, there have been Apple, there has been Microsoft, there has been Amazon, era-defining brands that have entered and become the most valuable brands. But these have sustained and these have endured. And that is because consumer's decision journey, whether the consumer is online, whether the consumer is offline, it's the same person. He doesn't become a strange person when he goes online. He's exactly the same individual. So consumer's decision journey is like a feedback loop. There are three parts to it. And if you get all the three parts right, it leads to about 46% growth as per the data that we have analyzed. 46% growth more than average growth that you would have normally got if you had not, if, if organically the categories had grown the way they are growing. And those three parts are the bottom, you can see experience and activation. It's very obvious, experience. I experience the brand. I like it, I buy it again. But experience can only take you that far. You have to ensure your bucket doesn't leak, but you have to also acquire consumers. So experience can just lead you to a certain level. The second is activation. I'm on the shelf, I'm available, I will get picked up. And that contributes to about 12%. It's a more short-term measure, which is what we talk a lot about when we talk about performance marketing, when we talk about multi-touch point attribution. We are actually focusing only on activation. But what sits above it all, contributing to 27% of the growth, is brand equity. A term that is, everybody knows that it matters. Everybody knows there's a thing called equity. Otherwise, there is no point of having a brand. You could as well be a commodity. A brand is a brand because it triggers memories, associations in the consumer's mind. It, 
and, and you, you therefore have a natural inclination to pick it up. It is distinctive, it is differentiated. So that intangible asset that makes the commodity brand is what equity is. Equity is not spoken enough in boardrooms. Equity is not measured enough. Equity is not monitored enough. But it does contribute 27% to brand growth, business outcomes. And this is data from Kanta Brand Z. This is global data. Uh, Brand Z is, as I said, is the annual. Uh, we do it annually. It looks at consumer perception of brand and combines it with market perception of brands, shareholder perception of brand, and we give a value to the brand. It's a brand valuation study, globally the largest and the most uh, respected, I would say. Uh, and what we have shown consistently, both globally and in India, is that the Brand Z portfolio of the top brands have consistently outgrown market. And then you can see that very clearly here. And this is like hard evidence. This is evidence that marketers should take to the boardroom when they're asking for marketing budgets. Investing in brand leads to actual shareholder return. And this is India data. Top 50 India brands. In 2023, they had a value of 340-odd uh, billion. And if you just see the growth that has happened, it's actually grown much faster than GDP growth over the same period. So the natural GDP growth, GDP growth is about 7%, and brand Z top 50 has grown 18%. They are five times as big uh, in the last 10 years. And about, I think, five odd Indian brands have actually made it to the global list as well, four or five Indian brands. One of them is uh, TCS, which was our most valued brand, and Airtel, which has become the world's most valued, or actually the most, the max, has gained the most in the world list as a telecom brand. So it feels very proud to have Indian brands in the global list of Brand Z. And how do, therefore, brands drive value? Uh, this is the Kantar construct of how brands drive value, and a lot of brands across the world actually believe in it and do it regularly. A lot of, uh, I would say a lot of brands that are trying to build themselves today, a lot of startups, probably need to start thinking about building brand value. So there are two parts to it demand power and pricing power. Now, the easiest way to build fame or recognition for the brand is to build salience. You have to know the brand. So brute salience, if everybody knows your brand, obviously, you will bring, build some value in the market. But that salience will be wasted. Those monies are going down the drain if there is no meaningful association that is getting triggered because of that. And therefore, when we talk of virality of our content that we are putting out online, does virality actually mean affinity? Does virality lead to purchase truly, completely attributable to the virality? These are the questions we should be asking a lot more than we do today. So meaningful salience drives demand power or today's value. Pricing power is how much of premium can your brand actually command. And that for that, you need to be meaningful or relevant, but you also need to be differentiated. Because unless you are differentiated, the consumer is not going to pay extra for you. And differentiation doesn't mean being distinctive, having a great pack or having a great, uh, you know, absolutely different looking logo, different, or, or having a communication that just breaks clutter just by being shocking. And there's a lot of such communication that gets put, up, put, put out every day. Differentiation means consistently standing for something that the consumer thinks makes you different from the rest. A Levi's, Nike, consistent brands, consistently differentiated brands over the years, or a Dove. And strong brands tend to perform well across all the pillars, meaningful, different, and salient. The colors I've got mixed up, so the first pillar is meaningful, different, and salient. And you can see Sensodyne there, a brand that's differentiated. It's not as it didn't have to invest as much in salience because it had a differentiated proposition to start with. You could say that it was a different niche category, but then they found, the, I mean, they created the category. So that consumer truth and remaining differentiated and stuck and cons being considered a specialist on that is what has led them to build a very strong brand in a very stable stake market. Tesla. Now, this is a great example of a brand that 
remains differentiated wherever it goes. It's differentiated in US, it's differentiated in UK, it's differentiated in South Korea. Just look at the blue bar. It stands on differentiation. But the complexion of the differentiation differs. In US, it's a lot more aspirational. In UK, much more of a specialist. Korea, it's still an outsider. So you can take the same differentiation, but build around different facets of the differentiation. What Tesla has also done is, to, is gone beyond functionality to build emotional connection or emotional differentiation. Because functionality is, will become, again, stable stakes. Like EV was new. Now EV is not new. So you need to go beyond and you know, connect with the consumer emotionally as well. Now, in India, if you look at startups, and I'm just showing this data, not, making, not getting into any debate, we know this. Value has dropped 15% in one year, versus India top 75 brands, which actually lost only 4%. So just data to think about, the need to build brands consistently. And even more important, in inflationary times, when this is from 2019 to 2023, Consumer perception of net worth of brands, different, different brands. It's gone from 59% to 50%, 10% drop. In do I think the brand I'm buying is worth paying for? Again, emphasizing the importance of equity. So, meaningful, different, salient, create value for today. But also, create value for tomorrow. And I do want to leave, a, leave this thought behind on sustainability. We spoke a lot about purpose in the previous group. Purpose, purpose is anything that you believe is purpose and you can convince the consumer is your purpose. But this is, I would say, beyond purpose. This is something that you are doing for society, for environment. And one of the areas that we have found where globally brands are lacking and also in India is on sustainability credentials. The fact is that versus 11% of all the brands that are part of Brand Z, and 2%, only 2% of the globe top brands in the Brand Z portfolio stand on sustainability or lead sustainability versus 11% of all brands that we surveyed. So effectively, the most valuable global brands are today not being seen as sustainable brands. You could say, is it important? Is it relevant? Yes, it is important and relevant. And we have data, in fact, this is India data, to show that it is driving close to 8% or 9% of demand power and about 7% of price power. It may seem small, but if you look at the investments we are making in sustainability, this could be a game changer going forward and could be a competitive edge in the market as well. So I think I'm anyway sort of running out of time. I would leave you with these three Thoughts, brand equity is the root and the only root to sustainable shareholder value. All the rest are just roots to building brand equity. Are we building brand equity? Are we being able to monitor brand equity? Are we measuring the right aspects of brand equity? I think these are the questions. At some point, every, every brand marketer and every startup founder everyone in the room will have to ask themselves. When you build equity, leverage your brand's differentiation because that can reduce the price sensitivity of the consumer. And the third is, as you are building for today, keep in mind that tomorrow, sustainability could be a lead driver of brand equity. It is today a missed opportunity globally. There are a few brands that stand on it, but not your leading brands. It is definitely a missed opportunity in India. Now, sustainability does not mean just your ESG charter. Sustainability means something that you are doing very clearly and communicating to the consumer. It doesn't have to be environmental. It could be social. There are there the entire UN sustainability charter. It could be any of those. And uh, we do have a survey that actually tells us what is more important in each sector. But this is an area where probably the brand that takes the lead could reap advantages in future. Two minutes left, and I, I sort of went very uh, you know, rapidly through it. So I hope this has given some different thoughts to this day till now. And uh, I don't know if the, I'm happy to take any questions over coffee or anything else that you may want to know more about. Uh, thank you, and it is a pleasure to be here to do this. Thank you.